Hello, everybody, and welcome to Buster's Beat, a brand new podcast where we will be discussing queer entertainers and entertainment. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. This is my first ever episode. Uh, And a little bit about the podcast is we are going to be covering um, what it's like to be a queer entertainer in queer entertainment. Uh, I am a local North Shore drag king. And yeah, we're going to be having different guests on for each episode and not just drag performers, but also comedians, writers, uh, actors, all of the above. And just kind of talk about what it's like to be queer in 2024, what it's like to be in entertainment and how that affects our day to day lives. So my very first guest on my podcast is none other than my drag brother, Dick Kayan. Hi, Dick. Howdy. Thanks for being here today. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited. I know. I'm excited, too. This is kind of surreal for me because I've always wanted to do a podcast. uh, And now we're in like a very proper looking podcast studio doing it, courtesy of Peabody TV and uh, producer Randall behind me, who I would turn and wave at. But I know that (laughs) she can see me, but uh, she's going to be mixing up all of our audio and doing all the technical things because I don't know how to do any of that. And that's kind of been my main obstacle. So when she approached me and asked, like, hey, do you want to do a podcast? I'll do all the hard work. I was like, great. I just have to show up and talk to my friends. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, I thought no better first guest than you, because you and I have done so much together, both in and out out of drag and on and off the stage and we both talk about all sorts of things in real life so I figured why not throw on some microphones and capture the magic yeah so uh, introduce yourself Uh, you can give us your stage name your off stage name if you want any pronouns any labels identifiers anything you want to throw out there to let our listeners know who you are fabulous so first of all uh thank you so much for having me i'm so excited to be back here since the um uh documentary that we did a couple months ago uh but my name is dick kane i am a drag king burlesque performer artist performer all around my uh, preferred pronouns are they them and i of course say preferred because i am fine with all pronouns um, usually I like to treat it as like a reading the room thing where if I look like I'm dressed like a dude, maybe stay away from she, her. Just Yeah, I kind of brain. flow that way too. Yeah. Like, you know, th- there's no such thing as gender. But also if I put this much effort into my mustache, please don't call me ma'am. I'm 5'1", but I can be <laughs> just as mad as anyone out there. Short kings, baby. Absolutely. I've been performing... Forever, basically. But, I mean, I mainly perform here in Salem and the North Shore area, uh, mainly with the hometown queeros. We are a art collective, um, and we have some main members, I'd say, which is uh, Ms. Diamond Wigfall, Maxine Harrison, Miss Michael, Buster Pants, myself, Dick Kane. We also have Pee Wee Vermin, and then we have some floating members, um, like Vex the Very and Vex. Rick Disgrin. And uh, there's definitely some more out there. Stardust. Stardust, Stardust of course, Cropper, one of yeah. them. Stardust Cropper. It's basically like, I feel like if you have performed with us more than once, you are now a member of that collective. I don't think we ever decided to call ourselves the Hometown Queeros. I think it started kind of as like a joke almost. <laughs> and then... It just stayed. Yeah, I think some of the best names for things kind of start as like a, well, I guess we could use this. And then like nothing else like flows better. And then it's like, okay, this is who we are now. We are the hometown queeros. Absolutely. And it's it's really cool because I feel like now that is a recognized group name. Like when I performed at other shows um, and they ask for a bio, I'll say I'm a member of the collective, the Hometown Queeros, and people cheer, and I'm like, oh. Oh, you know us. <laughs> We've reached. <laughs> We've reached. We have. I've had that happen to me at a few shows where people are like, oh, Buster Pants, a member of the Hometown Queeros. I love them. And I'm like, oh, you you know us? <laughs> you know our lore. <laughs> you, yeah, you know the backstory. <laughs> it's a it's a Marvel Cinematic Universe-sized yeah. headcanon. So. I definitely think the... um. 
the documentary that we filmed uh, with Peabody here at TV. Peabody TV. <laughs> yeah, here at Peabody TV. Um, definitely also had that reachability. There's been my therapist. Oh, my therapist. Your therapist watched it. <laughs> yeah, he was oh like, God. yeah, I um, saw the article because he's from Beverly, and he's like, I saw the article, and I was like, wait, I know that person. I'm their therapist. Oh, my God. And he was like, it was great. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Because I've only talked about, um, you know, I I tend to focus on other things in therapy aside from what I'm... You don't want to unpack the hometown queeros (laughs) in your therapy? (laughs) I I have to talk a little about these guys. I have to I have to bring this up so you get it. Well, I bet that helped with a lot of backstory for your therapist of like, oh well, let me write some of this down. We'll bring it up in our next session. Oh yeah, no, it was um, it was exciting to see because um, I feel like a lot of the times my personal life I keep pretty separate from performing life. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting to see like, oh, the crossover episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of putting yeah. it. A little crossover episode. I feel like that happens to me a lot at work. I work at a bar here in Salem, or we're in Peabody, but over in Salem, I should say. Mm-hmm. And every once in a while I'll be working and someone will come up and be like, are you Buster Pants? And I'm just <laughs> like, yes. But imagine if I wasn't. Yeah. Now, what a weird question that would be for someone who isn't Buster Pants. <laughs> what did you just say to me? What did you call me? <laughs> Nothing. Never mind. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I hope if that's happened to anybody out there in the North Shore, I'm terribly sorry for it to be called such a thing. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, um, you know, I, I always was taken aback when people recognize me out of drag just because, um, you know, I wear wigs and I do like crazy makeup and stuff. And especially when I work my other job, when I mm-hmm. do tarot, I'm very, very high femme, very glam. That's true. And people Your other, other personality. Me. <laughs> my other, other character. <laughs> we both have a few. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's, it's just um, I'm kind of impressed. It's one level of me being impressed and like mm-hmm. appreciative and the other level being like, are you telling me I'm bad at makeup oh, <laughs> by recognizing me? I just always blame my hair. Yeah. I feel even though my hair changes a lot, like because I don't wear wigs and people recognize me, I'm just like, I think it's my voice and my hair. Yeah. I mean, I don't do very heavy, heavy makeup, so I think I'm pretty easy to recognize in and out of drag, but I'm always taken aback when someone happened to me at the grocery store once. That mm-hmm. was the most alarming. It was very nice and I felt very cool, but this person also screamed and ran at me, which like, like the song, I have a song called Hella High at Whole Foods mm. and uh, yeah, I was. And to be screamed and run at from behind while someone's going, you're poster pants. I'm like, yes, thank you. I'm not a beetle though. <laughs> you know, I'm not that famous, but it did make me feel cool if a little bit scared. <laughs> oh yeah, no, oh, definitely. It's, um, you know, uh, cause you and I uh, met each other basically through the Baphomets. We did. Where we were um, I members. remember the first time you performed at the Baphomets oh, and I yeah. was like, this person right here <laughs> is it. The Baphomets, it was a collective of burlesque performers uh, started by Katie Coffin. That mm-hmm. was her troupe that she put together. Um, and I was one of the original. There was four members. Um, and I feel like every time we did a show we would have a guest. And I remember the first number I saw you do was was um, when we did the Mother Goose like fairy tale show, oh, yeah. and you did like a Hansel and Gretel number, and you were like eating Cheetos on stage, and you were so hilarious. And I was like, if we don't add this person, I'm gonna be so pissed. <laughs> so then we're like, oh no, yeah, that that's a new member of our group. Um, that was, whew, I was like, thank goodness, I, I need another like weird. Mo- I mean, we're all weird in our own ways, yeah. but it was a very like femme forward group and everyone was very accepting of our gender expression diversity but the burlesque scene is very femme forward yeah definitely so it was nice to have a fellow weirdo in the in the troupe absolutely Uh, someone who was all about being a little bit more comical in addition to sexy you know looking back on it now because this is we disbanded the group in 2020 yeah during the pandemic we did not survive the pandemic yeah and it's you know i think that um I had a great time being part of the Baphomets. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just the type of thing that I think it existed for the time that it could feasibly exist for. Yeah. Maybe um, a little longer than it should have. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was great to just right off the bat have a residency show. Yeah. But it also was like, wow, I was not prepared for a residency show at yeah, that point in my life. Yeah, having a brand <laughs> new show every month every for a month. year 
was a lot. I think it oh, kind of yeah. took its toll on all of us <laughs> in different ways. Oh, yeah. It, um, Which was great. I think um, the thing I really liked about it is sometimes I like I need an assignment to do the work. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll kind of rest on my laurels of like, all right, well, I got 50 numbers so I can reuse all of them. But when someone's like, no, no, it needs to be something specific for this or it forces me out of my creative comfort zone. Um, and that did a lot of that for me, which I'm, I'm very grateful for at the end of the day. For naturally creative people who tend to usually fall into the ADHD or neurodivergent category, um, I think that being told do whatever sometimes can be much more limiting than yeah. like follow this theme. <laughs> so I'm always that's why I'm like, oh, we love a theme. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I have that love hate relationship with themes because sometimes mm -hmm. I just like to kind of do whatever I want. If someone's like, oh, well, it needs to be this kind of thing and I don't automatically have an idea. I'm just like, Ugh. yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to do that. But it, it does force me to like, all right, well, listen to 50 new songs that might inspire you or something. For sure. And then a lot of my ideas come out of like making a joke about it. Like my Mike Myers, Mike Myers number. That, it's, it's, been really a, it's a staple. I'll never stop doing that <laughs> number. And for those of you listening who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, it's a burlesque drag number that I do where I am... Uh, Mike Myers as Austin Power doing Michael Myers from Halloween. Um, and it's a classic. I love doing it. But it started as a joke, fully yeah. as a joke, where I was like, well, you know, it'd be stupid. And then someone was like, I'll, I'll put that mix together for you. <laughs> and now it's one of my most well-known numbers that I do. Yeah, it's a great. It's also the type of thing that, like, I haven't seen replicated before not yet <laughs> Which, not not until people listen to this <laughs> well, once this goes viral then maybe <laughs> oh yeah no it's um i think that uh with i think we experienced it a lot when we were doing burlesque mm -hmm. where there was a interesting level of like defensiveness that came with the ideas that we were creating mm -hmm. and if we saw those ideas being replicated even if it was by people we've never spoken to. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think it's especially in like the drag burlesque community, it's natural that you're probably going to think of similar numbers to someone else halfway yeah. across the world. <laughs> and it's not stealing. It's nothing like that. No. It's just that's kind of what happens. Yeah, I I find myself having to remind myself that um, like there's really no such thing as like an original human thought or experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, there are in the grand scheme of things. But like if I come up with an idea or a song that I want to use, like it doesn't make it mine. It's not my song that then nobody else gets to use for the rest of forever. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> sometimes I have to remind myself to like let go of that kind of defensiveness of like, oh, somebody took my idea. Now, if I do write like original raps and if somebody used one of those without consulting me, that that would be different. But, you know, if I'm using a song that's like it's a top 40 song, you know, millions and millions of people around the world know this song. And I happen to use it in a drag number like and then see someone else do it. Yeah, I need to, you know, I just got to let it go sometimes. I'm like, this isn't yours per se. You just are attached to it. You know? Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I think that that um, going into the idea of like gatekeeping and things like that. It's <laughs> um, like girl boss gatekeeping. <laughs> It's, um, you know, I think that it should be more of a uh, idea of how interesting that I came up with this and I was attached to this. And this person who does not know me, to my understanding, did something that was similar. Uh, the how difference, dare they? Yeah. <laughs> the difference being like, OK, well, you know, why would somebody want to see this number that I'm doing over this person? Yeah. Or alternatively, how can we collaborate together and do something? There's been a lot of times where I've been like, wow, I'd love to do this as a mix. But I, um, this I really, don't have the technology to I, clean it up. I just don't have the technology. <laughs> this incredibly specific line from a movie I saw in the 80s, yeah. I can't find it. And it's, okay, well, we'll figure it out. Sometimes with mixes, I'm doing, like, reverse gatekeeping, <laughs> where I'm like, I... This is so niche, and I'm praying somebody out there is going to hear it and lose their mind. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it's... Um, <laughs> It's happened maybe once, 
and I've been like, this is who I do this for. Yeah, <laughs> that happens to me a lot. That's another thing I've had to kind of embrace slash let go of is a lot of the things that I like to perform to are things that people don't get. Yeah. Either I'm you know, it's the wrong age group or it was too esoteric mm-hmm. or, you know, I I often joke like Buster Pants is for the dads. Like a lot of the song choices and clips that I use are like, yeah, are you like a 55 year old straight guy? You might get this reference, which, <laughs> you know, Occasionally they're in the room and then they are thrilled that they can relate to something. But usually when we're performing for like the 25 year old queer community and they're just like, what is this guy talking about? Um, So I've kind of had to I don't let all of those things go. You know, I don't want to lose any of the weird original ideas or thoughts. And it's okay if people don't get every Mm -hmm. quote or reference that I'm making. Um, But it's been really interesting over the years to be like, this is a great idea. And then every time I perform it, I'm just like, nobody gets it. Like, nobody's having a good time. This isn't going as well as I thought. (laughs) So trying to, like, toe that line of, like, keeping the ideas that I had and also, like, peppering in ways that people might get the joke or the reference or swapping some things out so that people know what's going on. For sure. I think that with um, Big Gay Night Out, um, our new residency show. Oh, yes. uh, Plug plug Big Gay Night Out. It's the third Thursday of every month at... uh, Oh, God, I'm not... Hallowed ground, Hallowed ground, as it's now called. I call uh, it by its former name most yeah, of the time. It's, uh, we, our original residency show that we did with the Baphomets was at the same place. So same we have, building back we, when it was yeah. called the Opus Underground. The Opus Underground. Which I can't let go. I'm always like, yeah, I got a show tonight at Opus. Yeah. And everyone's like, huh? What are I'm you like, talking Dire about? I mean, I mean, <laughs> Hallowed Ground. I mean, uh. The real ones know. Yeah, the, re- the real ones know. <laughs> no, we have, uh, it's uh, every third Thursday of the month and it is I feel like every now and then we'll do like a soft theme but it's usually like an accidental theme yeah, accidental almost. theme <laughs> but it's usually just whatever we want and we just perform all night and it's a free show and the cool thing about doing residency is that it does kind of give you the um, space to explore new and weird things so that's definitely a lot of fun. It's that, a good little testing ground. Yeah. Uh, let's see how this goes over. Bad? Mm. <laughs> we'll tr- try it here before we take it somewhere else out into the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's always because people, you know, when they show up, they know what they're expecting. They're coming to see us, which is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's also a great place for people who, like, aren't expecting a drag show. They're just down there sitting at the bar, and then we come down in full drag and set up the speakers, and they're just like... What is going on here tonight? And sometimes they stay. Sometimes they take off as fast as they can to be like, a drag show, get me out of here. But a lot of the time they stay. So we do have our locals and our regulars who come out and support us every month, which is amazing. But it is a good place to kind of like nudge people who may not have come to a drag show and kind of trick them into being at a drag show, which I love. Yeah, it's also just great. Um, And there's no cover. No cover. Totally free. Totally but, you know, free. tip us, please. Please. <laughs> please. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great way to, um, I think, not fall out of just performing practice, too. Because uh, if there's, you know, a month that I'm not really performing, I could always be like, well, there is Big Gay Night Out. So yeah. I will at still have the opportunity to perform whether I want to work on a number or I have something coming up in mm-hmm. another city or place and I want to get this practice out first that'd be great so you really get to go to like a proto show every time you go to big gay night out you get the behind the scenes (laughs) of the thought process and it's up close and personal like it's a small room with low ceilings and you know you are right there (laughs) right in your face so besides drag when did you start when did you start identifying yourself as an entertainer? Like were you a theater kid? How far back does that go? Mm-hmm. Like what is your kind of introduction like your pre-drag entertainment and yeah. like how did that lead you into drag? So I was always um in performing. My mom uh was an actor uh in New York all throughout the eighties. Mm. Yeah, back I when think I knew that. Back when New York was New York, yeah. like Ninja Turtle, <laughs> back New when York. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the pre Disneyfication uh, of yeah. New York. That was what she did. So she always was doing like dinner theater and off Broadway and things like that. So I always grew up around theater and performing. And then um, when I was 
growing up, like a lot of people, I think, that have actor parents, not everyone, but um, my mom naturally started just putting me in theater all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was always performing or singing or doing something like that. And, you know, I was talking to um, Lydia, my wife, the other day about, uh, because we were watching um, Quiet on the Set. Uh, That's the Nickelodeon documentary just came out. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I know what that is, but remind me. I haven't seen it, but Um, I've heard a lot. (laughs) It's just all of the um, abuse that's come out about, like, childhood stars from the 90s. And I was a child in the 90s, and I was living in California, right outside of Anaheim, where they were doing all of those. And I think all the time, because my mom is older, well, I was born when she was 42. Mm. I think all the time, if my mom was younger, I would have been one of those kids. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't think she had the understanding of like, I'm going to bring you to this casting call. Like, because my mom still like now as an adult, she's like, we have to get you an agent. And I'm like, mom, it doesn't really work <laughs> like that anymore. But thank you. I appreciate that. Kinda. <laughs> yeah. And so I always was doing that. And then I, uh, when I went to college, I majored in theater. Um, And majoring in theater taught me that I do not want to be an actor. (laughs) (laughs) I am right there with you. I also majored in theater and was like, wow, I don't want to do this. Yeah. But it was a a fun time. (laughs) Oh, I'm grateful for the stuff I learned. Yeah. For sure. Um, One of the biggest things I took away from learning theater in a professional setting Mm -hmm. was um, a audition class that I took Mm -hmm. where they talked about the importance of brand identity for yourself Mm. as an actor. And they were talking about, you know, you have to be aware of how you look and you have to be aware of when you walk into a room, what is the first thing people are going to assume about you? Okay. Um, And how can you use that to your benefit to get a part? And I was like, cool. So I went through theater school and had the realization that I don't want to do traditional acting, <laughs> yeah. but I would love to do performing. And finding like drag and burlesque, I ended up, I lovingly refer to it as the scum circuit. Because <laughs> I'm like, no, we perform in bars. Yeah. We perform in basements. Yeah. And uh, every now and then we'll get like a snazzy little theater, but it's not the standard. And no. I like that. <laughs> I like that. The floors are often sticky. Oh, yeah. I, I like <laughs> And the we're idea. down there rolling around on it. <laughs> and we're sticking dollar bills to ourselves. Yeah. Wearing, you know, fake body parts. <laughs> no, no. And it was um, uh, performing is what I realized was definitely what interests me. I yeah. love to perform, to do my little dance, be a little silly little guy. Be a silly little guy. And with drag and burlesque and everything that falls into that category, I think that you're given much more of an allowance of creative freedom. You know, performing in general is anytime I go through uh, stages of depression or anything like that, Mm -hmm. um, it's always been the type of thing that I end up naturally gravitating back towards and kind of sinking myself into. And I think part of that is being the other character. And part of it is kind of, I guess, kind of a physical way to work through the emotions. Yeah, it's a good way to literally get out of yourself. Like, oh, I'm depressed. I'm just going to be someone else for a while and see how that goes. Not capable of depression. (laughs) This guy doesn't know how to be depressed. Not at all. (laughs) Not even a little bit. You know, I feel like the characters you develop as a performer, they kind of come naturally and you shift into it. Mm Mm-hmm. And you are in character, but it's much less of a fourth wall character and more of just an attitude kind of that will go away once you take (laughs) off everything. Um, Did you ever get uh, typecast a lot as like a particular kind of character when you were doing more traditional theater in school or? Yeah, I am something that uh, which maybe you've also experienced um, majoring in theater (laughs) is um, theater is such a. The traditional aspect is so um, has such a, an ability to be so destructive. I was going to say toxic. <laughs> yeah, so toxic and so destructive to somebody's mental health and boundaries yeah. for the purpose of being in a play. For the art. Yeah, and it was, I was 
told things that now in retrospect, at the time, you know, I was young. I was a very young person. I started college when I was 17. Oh, I didn't and, know that. Yes, I was quite young. And um, they would kind of encourage us and be very frank with us about things that were really not healthy. Mm. So my professor told me that they would typecast me as a cutter. That's what they said to me. And I like just had self harm cutting? Yes, okay. Like okay. a cutter, oh, self harm, mentally ill. And I was like, wow. yeah, I was like, hmm, <laughs> all right then. And, you know, when I think a lot of people, especially after high school, when they go into theater, they're like, oh, I want to play like uh, Belle from Beauty yeah, and the I Beast. I want to be a beautiful leading lady. <laughs> yeah. Or like, <laughs> like guess what? You're the teapot. <laughs> yeah. No. No, the um, like self-harm teapot. And I'm like, great. And I started getting um, encouraged to do a lot of like monologues and study more characters that were very like specifically like mentally unwell, like <laughs> flight risk, like gone girl style characters. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I was like 18. And You're like, great. <laughs> I was like, hmm, you know, I, I would have been fine with ensemble. <laughs> but uh, so that was always difficult because even just kind of going into my own gender before I even knew what it really was. Um, I remember growing up, I always wanted to play male characters in plays. Mm -hmm. When we did Charlie and Chocolate Factory, I remember I was like, I really want to be Charlie. Um, I like the idea of playing like the boy character mm -hmm. um, or the male character. I thought yeah. it was... Initially, I was like, oh, it's cool. It's funny. But then I realized later on in life, it's like, oh, no, it's because I'm queer. Yeah, because I'm actually <laughs> connecting to this character. Yeah. I, I got typecast a lot as male parts. There, oh, were, really? there were very few years where I got cast as female parts whenever I would do like drama club things. The first play I was ever in in the second grade, I got typecast or I got cast as a male character, which like... You know, it's second graders, so like it wasn't heavy gender issues yeah. going on, but I just remember I got cast in that. I was a gang member in West Side Story. Nice. I was the big bad wolf. Like I was always getting cast as male characters. And then if I got cast as a female character, it was never a leading, leading lady. Mm -hmm. It was always either like the slutty best friend or someone very matronly. Because I was tall and I had like this big presence. They were like, you can't be this dainty little damsel. Like yeah. you gotta be the big old mom character who's, you know, snapping necks and cashing checks more than anything yeah. else. So, you know, my sister got cast as Cinderella, you know, and I got cast as like the queen who <laughs> has like misophonia in this version. Yeah. It's just like the oh. rat that's a horse. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, uh, which I which I enjoyed, but I used to get very upset. Yeah, that's always typecasting with theater. Yeah, and it's um, they were like, "You're a boy, no? Well, then you're a mom or a <laughs> drunk." And I'm just like, "Oh, huh." But I mean, my voice has pretty much sounded like this since the sixth grade, yeah. and I was also this tall in the sixth grade, so it was really hard for me to be a believable tiny little lady when none of the boys had hit puberty yet, and there I was, like, "Hello." I'm here. I'm the big bad wolf. <laughs> it's so it's just, um, you know, it, it's good to see that, I think, because of shows like Hamilton and stuff mm -hmm. and not cats somehow. But we're <laughs> now able to suspend our disbelief more <laughs> where you don't have to look cats. <laughs> it's, it's like people are fine. They could be like, no, Andrew I, Lloyd Webber's going to sue <laughs> us now. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I can totally believe that these are cats on the stage. But don't you dare cast like a tall Annie. Or else we're done. <laughs> How dare you cast I'm an Annie out. with a deep voice. <laughs> we're not having this. And I, I think because of things like that in theater, maybe we're going to start seeing a change in terms of like, you know, we could cast um, fat people as leading ladies. We could cast male parts as female parts and vice versa. We can like remove that because we're here to see the show. And yeah. it's a show, isn't it? <laughs> We're here to suspend the disbelief. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, you know, I'm glad that I was able to uh, realize it once I was in school mm -hmm. rather than kind of cling to this idea of like, I have to be an actor. Yeah. Because uh, I'd, I'd be very different. So, Are you familiar with like Lydia Lunch and like Karen Finley? No, it doesn't ring a bell. They're both like, so Lydia Lunch was definitely very like, Punk. Um, she has. A, do you actually? Um, 
the monologues I used to do burlesque to back in the Baphomets. Yes. Those were Lydia Lunch monologues oh. that I'd be performing. So I don't know if she's listening to this, but Lydia, please don't sue me or kick my ass. You have a great name, Lydia Lunch. <laughs> Lydia Lunch. Like, she's such a baddie. I highly recommend checking her out. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, she produced music. She does a lot of, like, live, strange, avant-garde performances. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. I hope she's still out there doing yeah. her damn thing because, like, she's so cool. But I remember learning about her and Karen Finley, who also did these really radical avant-garde things, um, like reciting monologues while, like, covering herself in, like, honey and chocolate, but, like, not in a sexy way, in a way to, like, educate about some really horrible things in the world. Um, But I remember seeing that, and I was like, wait, why are we doing that? Like, why are we performing Twelfth Night for the millionth (laughs) time when you could be letting us run wild and do these things? Um, So that, for me, was a big, like, light bulb of, like, okay, you don't actually want to do theater like you just want to perform yeah and trying to like find that in between from doing you know traditional theater in college to when I started doing burlesque there was that gap of time where I was like I don't know what I'm going to do with this skill set but I know there's something so when I was approached you know years later by Katie who was like I'm gonna start this burlesque troupe do you want to be a part of it and the my first answer was yes but i'm gonna be weird i'm gonna get real weird with it and she was like no good i want that and i was so relieved that i was like i have an outlet like the outlet has found me (laughs) so a lot of the time when people are like oh well like how do you how do you get into it how do you start i'm like sometimes you just get lucky sometimes you just meet someone who's like hey you want to do a thing and then you just launch from there and there were a lot of dominoes that fell in such a way where, you know, I'd been doing theater since the first or second grade. You know, I had taken burlesque classes. I enjoy enjoy taking my clothes off for strangers. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of things fell in the right way, but there was no specific thing. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time where somebody else wanted to do it. So sometimes the universe just pushes you that way. Yeah. And then I feel very like gatekeepy when people are like, well, how did you get your start? And I'm like, sometimes it just happens. Like I'm not trying to withhold information. I and then I have to try to like give advice the best that I can. Like sometimes you just kind of fall into it. Yeah. It's one part's like, you know, what is the accessibility? What is the saturation? What does your town look like? Yeah. And, um, you know, just getting out there and doing it, looking up, going, honestly, starting with just going to more shows is how you start. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that's a, that's a good little segue into another topic is like, you know, advice for people who want to perform, because I feel like you and I both do like, ask me anything on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. And, a lot of it I have to sort through. It's just like, who do you have a crush on? And I'm like, I'm in my 30s, yeah. okay? I'm not really crushing on anyone. So I know it's like some 19-year-old being like, oh, my God. Uh, which, hey, you know, if you're listening, thank you. Um, I have no free time, and my I don't, I don't go lower than, like, 27, okay? But I every <laughs> once in a while there's, like, actual good questions in there. Yeah. But frequently I find it's a lot of people being like, how do I start? Um, so what is your – when people ask you, like, what are your kind of canned answers that you give to people? Because I'm sure you also get that a lot. Yeah, but um, a big thing I like to ask people is why do you want – to get into this. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you want to get into it as a hobby because you really want to do it and you think it will be fun? Um, Do you want to do it because you just want to experience it and say that you did it? Do you want to do it as a job? Do you want to make money doing it? And I think that um, if you approach it, maybe deciding on what one of those things you want the most it's going to be a little bit easier to kind of map out where you want to go from there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think for people that if they want to do drag as a career, um, I think it's important to understand that it takes a long, long, long time Mm -hmm. to be able to say, yeah, no, I would say that doing drag performing is now on par with how I make money. For a living. Yeah. It takes a long time. It's a lot of connections. It's a lot of, you know, you really have to have at least a repertoire of like 10 plus things you could pull out 
at the drop of a hat. Yeah. And they should all be different. But a big part of that is something kind of echoing what we talked about when we first started talking is Mm -hmm. if I'm doing something that everyone else is doing, everyone's using the same number, you know, how can I make myself different? And I think developing a character is so important because, you know, developing a character is how can you create a look? How can you create a performance that is so intrinsically intertwined to who you are? Yeah. Names are important for that reason, too. Names are tricky. Coming up with a drag name is very tricky. I think a lot of people get bogged down and like, it's got to be a pun. It Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a pun. (laughs) Everybody, if you're listening out there and you're trying to come up with a drag name, it doesn't have to be a pun. (laughs) No, not at all. If you come up with a good one, great. But like people get really bogged down like, but that's not funny. And I'm like, but do you connect to it regardless of whether or not it's funny? And also, do you want to be a funny person? drag artist yeah you also don't have to be funny you know i think that's another part of it is like you know who is this character you're creating are they more serious are they more political are they more funny um and you don't have to stick to that but especially when you first start off try and come out the gate with like something that's solidified and then Mm -hmm. the more you perform the more you'll get a better feeling of like things are going to change a little bit like when i first started doing drag um I, my name is Decayan. It's a joke on decaying because originally I was like, oh, I'm going to be like a spooky drag king. Ooh. I'm in Salem and I'll be like <laughs> spooky. And that has devolved. Mm-hmm. I am not a spooky drag king. I definitely do spooky things. But when I first started off, that's kind of what I was going for. And it just evolved over time. Mm-hmm. And I think it's better to start with something solid because then you could start changing it it's i don't think it's a good idea to just go into things being like i'll figure it out once i get there (laughs) because you know and it's just being comfortable with not making money know your worth like i'm I'm not telling anybody to work for free but like you might not be at the end of the day like yes you might go home with fifty dollars but how much did you pay for parking at the venue? Mm-hmm. And how much did you spend on your costume? Yeah. And how much time did you spend putting together your number? <clears throat> so you're walking away with $50 cash and you're making money and that feels great. But at the end of the day, if you're, you know, budgeting out your time and your resources, like, did you make a profit? Yeah. And not that you should have to to want to do it, but like you should be comfortable with the idea that this might not be a profitable venture for mm-hmm. you for a few years. Yeah. And the thing is, it's... It might not be perfect right away. That's the thing. I think a lot of newer people, people who either haven't done drag and are looking to get into it, or like those who are still brand new at it, want to be already five years in. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, listen, if you start now, imagine how good you're going to be in five years instead of stressing out that you're already five years behind. Time's going to pass either way. So like, do you want to spend this time wishing that you did it five years ago and continuing not to do it? Yeah. Or do you want to just jump in and imagine how great you'll be in five years? Because do you think you're not going to want to be doing this in five to ten years? Or, you know, if you get started in five years, but you wanted to get started five years ago. Now that's ten years that have gone by that you've been, you know, stressing out that you're not already at like a high level. Yeah, for sure. And it's like, you know, you don't have to start doing it and be like, well, first I have to learn how to sew before I try drag. Or first I have to learn how to do makeup. I have to learn how to dance. It's like, you well, could, I usually tell people like, start. yeah, I usually say like, what is the thing that you're already good at? Yeah. Like for me, you know, I didn't want to do makeup for a really long time because like it makes me or it used to make me very uncomfortable just physically, not like the, the gender yeah. dysphoria side of things, which also played its own role. But just like putting makeup on me always felt very uncomfortable. So I often would just do like a little bit of eyeshadow and glue on a mustache. And then over the years being like, OK, well, maybe now I can add a little bit of contouring and maybe I can add a little bit of this and maybe I can add a little bit of that. Um But I was still doing drag the entire time. Like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, I'm going to wait until I have an already completely finished, polished look. So people see my makeup and they go like, oh, that looks super easy to do. Like, I'm just going to dive right in and like, you can just show me exactly how to do your makeup. And I'm like, this took years for me to figure out like what I was comfortable with and building up a skill set to get where it's at. And for me, it's still evolving, you know, like every time I do makeup. 
and look at myself and see pictures and like different lighting. And then I know for next time this worked, this didn't work. So this time I'm going to do it differently or this is what I'm going to do the same. Um, So it's fun to evolve. So for me, my focus was always like, I know how to perform. I know how to be campy. I know Mm -hmm. how to roll around on the floor. I know how to rip my clothes off. So those were the things I leaned on. And then while I was doing all that, you know, distracting people with like my antics, they wouldn't really notice how weird my makeup was. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, your makeup gets better and better as you go. But then also your other skill sets go. So some people, you know, they really want to do drag, but they're like, I can't do makeup, but I know how to sing really well great a lot of people don't know how to sing or a lot of people don't know how to sew like lean on the things that you do have and then you can work on the things that you don't have as you go yeah absolutely you could always um uh you know sometimes i look back on things from years and years ago that i remember being like great and i look back (laughs) and i'm like oh man yeah (laughs) not quite i've got some real humbling pictures (laughs) yeah that was uh you know, I remember when we were doing the Baphomets, I was like, man, I wish we took more photos. But I am but glad also, <laughs> we did not so take more photos. I'm so glad we did it. <laughs> it was, um, you know, I think it's awesome to, um, something that's great about getting started is you can look back at the beginning. And genuinely, if you are a person that struggles with, like, this feeling of, like, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I'm as good as my peers. Mm-hmm. You can look back on your progress and be like, well, I'm better than that guy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Don't compare yourself to other people. Compare yourself to yourself. Exactly. Yeah. That's most humbling you could get. (laughs) Yeah. I, not that long ago, Diamond had sent me a picture that I think like popped up on her like two years ago today. (laughs) Two years ago. (laughs) No. Oh, no. It was like a drag brunch and it was like an outside drag brunch and Boy, do I look terrible. (laughs) I look so bad. But I remember at the time being like, look at me go. Look at this mustache. It's really great. Now just looking back on it like, I left the house like that. And people told me I looked good. Oh, no. No. I think like my hair was also slicked back, too, because I didn't know how to like put it up yet. Yeah. Uh, Because having hair is relatively new for me after six years of shaving my head. So that was still like the first few years of actually having hair to play with. I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Slick it back. No, it's it's so good. And it's honestly, I encourage people, you know, they want to practice makeup. Just always, always take pictures. You don't have to show it to anyone. Just (laughs) take pictures for yourself. It's kind of like um, when people start going to the gym and they want to gain muscle take photos. It's hard to see it happening yeah, in front of your eyes. you're not going to see it day to day, yeah. but you're going to look at that picture from two years ago and be like, oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my. Look I looked me. very different, even though I don't feel that different or feel like I've improved. Yeah, no, it's great. And yeah. then what's wonderful is that you can look back on numbers you've done in the past and be like, time to redo that Yeah, with a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got to learn not just from your mistakes, but your experiences, you know, all the oh, yeah. things in general. Like every I've been doing that Mike Myers, Mike Myers number now for five years. And like it, it changes a little bit every time mm-hmm. because I'll either see a picture or a video and be like, oh, it was really cool when I did that thing by accident. This time I'll do it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, same with like makeup performing. It should there should be a level of play that yeah. comes in with it. It's going to take you getting close with yourself to figure out what you want to do. Yeah, you got to get comfortable looking at yourself in the mirror, which is a lot. I think people don't realize going in like it is actually that hard to be taking those videos and looking at yourself in the mirror, but you get used to it. Oh, yeah. You get used to it. Absolutely. You don't make like I also recommend if you're ever practicing like dance moves in the mirror, don't make eye contact with yourself. (sighs) Watch what your body's doing. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of people are just like watching what their eyes are doing. And I'm just like, no, no, no. Look at what your legs are doing. If we're practicing choreography, it doesn't matter what your face looks like. Yeah. You'll, you'll get there eventually. Exactly. Work your way up to your face. Final remarks from you? <laughs> oh, I'm just so happy to be here. It's great to be with Buster and oh. Peabody TV doing a little podcast. I know. This is so exciting. I was really happy that you agreed to be my first guest because I was like, we have A, a lot of history, and B, I think we just converse very well and very naturally, so I didn't want it to be like a me like reading you interview questions nervously. I thought it would make for very good 
conversation and banter and getting a lot of good information out there to the good people listening or watching oh, this. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very, back very for happy your, to have you as my very first guest. Your 100th episode. Oh, my I'll goodness. Return. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. I'll be back. I have to make it to 100 episodes, but then we'll have you back. I it's, might have you back before oh, yeah. then. We'll see. Um, you know, the theoretical 100. That can mean a lot of things. Okay. <laughs> All right. 100 minutes of podcast. <laughs> It's like two episodes. Yeah. (laughs) It would be. All right. Well, that's it for the very first episode of Buster's Beat. I mean, I believe we had bonding, banter, and brilliance, as the subtitle will uh, say somewhere on there. (laughs) My God. Um, Thank you once again to Peabody TV and Randall for producing this little venture of mine. And uh, if you guys want to find me out there on the internet, I am only on Instagram. You can find me at Pants Buster. Again, my name is Buster Pants, so you got to reverse them. It's at Pants Buster, all one word. Uh, if you look up at Buster Pants, that is somebody's dog who has not posted since 2014. Um, so I think that dog is dead. But, you know, very cute. I still follow them in hopes that maybe it's just the world world's oldest dog. So that wraps it up for episode one. Thank you again, Dick Cain. Uh, thank you, Peabody TV. And we will catch you next time for Buster's Beat. See you then.